All right, so this lecture is going to look at effective stress versus total stress strength envelopes. Um, what we've been talking about so far is effective stress. So when we plotted our Mohr circle or our Mohr Coulomb failure envelope, we plotted tau on the y-axis and sigma prime on the x-axis. All right, notice this prime right there. Uh, notice the prime. That means that we're using effective stresses, right? So that tells us that we need to compute total stress, compute pore pressure, do total stress minus pore pressure, we get effective stress, that's how we're formulating our Mohr circle. The reason why we've done this so far is that effective stress is really fundamentally related to how tightly the particles are pressing against each other. So how big are those interparticle contact forces, and uh, that's really what controls strength and stiffness of soil. So it, it is fundamentally the thing that we want to use to quantify strength. So why on earth do we have to worry about this total stress strength envelope thing? Well, it turns out that there are some conditions for which knowing effective stress is really challenging. All right, we just saw in the previous lecture that during undrained loading, the soil will change effective stress, right? We start out with some initial effective stress condition, but then when we load it, if it's contractive, we'll, de we'll decrease effective stress. If it's dilated, we'll increase effective stress. So um, how much, right? How much effective stress is going to change? Well, that depends. Now we have to know not only whether the soil is contractive or dilated, we also have to know how much strain is going to be mobilized. If we're worried about strength, we can assume the strain is really big, but it's not always easy for us to, to know this, how much is the, the effective stress going to change. So that's the first bullet point that I'm um, talking about right here, right? For undrained loading conditions, which tends to be for clay or silty soils, basically where it takes time for water to flow out. So we're talking about saturated soil, 100% degree of saturation. In order for it to change volume during shear, water has to flow through, right? If it's fully saturated and it wants to contract, that's great, it can contract, but it has to expel water. If that water flows out really slowly, it can be undrained during shearing. So in the laboratory, we can control it by boundary conditions on the specimen. In the field, it tends to be controlled by the permeability of the soil. Low permeability of the soils tend to be undrained. So anyway, if we're doing loading of clay, loading of silt, something that is not going to have time for the water to drain out during the time that the loading's applied, then it's undrained. It's going to be really kind of difficult for us to know sigma prime. Um, the other reason why we sometimes do total stress envelopes is for unsaturated soil. Um, and we don't really have the basis to get into this yet. We'll talk about it during compaction when we get into uh, adding water to soil and then compacting it using some energy to get make it dense. Um, we'll talk about the effect of air bubbles on the behavior of the soil. It's a little bit too complicated to get into right now, but kind of a preview. When we get to unsaturated soil, it's actually really difficult for us to know the effect of stress as well because those bubbles actually change the effective stress condition compared to if the soil were saturated. So let's take a look here. I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do now is, is skip over this unsaturated one. I'm gonna talk about undrained loading and kind of explain in a little bit more detail how it's difficult for us to know uh, the effective stress and therefore it's difficult for us to know how much shear stress the soil can take before it fails. So um, let's say that we have a contractive soil that's red, and we'll have a dilative soil in green. And what I'm going to do is draw two different more circles corresponding to this initial loading condition. So right here we have an initial more circle, sigma v naught prime, sigma v h naught prime, sigma h naught prime, and then we're going to load from this condition and um, the circle will grow in some way and reach a failure condition. Okay, so if it's contractive, we know that sigma v naught prime will decrease, right? So we're going to be moving toward the left. Maybe we come over here and we'll fail right there along that failure envelope. Okay, so in that case, the shear strength 
or the tau FF, the uh, shear stress on the failure plane at failure is denoted by that red dot. That's our contractive one. So you can come over here and get uh, a measure of the shear strength. A lot of the time we use the shear stress on the failure plane at failure instead of the radius of the Mohr circle to define shear strength. Um, you, I guess you could take it as the radius also. That radius would be uh, a little bit bigger, right? Like right up there, tangent to the radius, slightly bigger. We often use tau FF instead. All right, now let's look at what would happen if it was dilative. Okay, now sigma V naught prime is going to increase, not decrease. We'll assume sigma H naught prime is increasing as well. So maybe we would fail along this kind of a circle like that. And I'm probably going to run out of room. I'll just draw it all the way over here anyway, even though it's a little bit off the x-axis. Okay, so now here is our uh, tau FF value. It's much higher, right? Makes sense. If the soil is dilative, it should be stronger in uh, undrained loading because that dilative tendency is, is suppressed. Effective stresses increase. So which of these two circles do we have? We need to know that if we want to assign a strength to the uh, soil. Well, instead of trying to figure out how much the effective stress is going to change during shearing, something that we often do instead is use a total strength, um, a total stress strength envelope. So um, the way that this would work is that now instead of plotting a here. Instead of plotting a sigma prime on the x-axis, mm -hmm. we just plot sigma, right? So no prime, because it's no longer effective stress. We would have tau versus sigma. All right, and then um, you would plot the total stress envelope instead of the effective stress envelope, and um, you would get... Um, well, for soil that's at a particular density, let's say that we test, uh, say we take this contractive soil, for example. Whoops, didn't want to circle it with the pen. Wanted to circle it with my little cool disappearing tool there. So let's take that contractive soil. The circle has a certain radius like this, right? And what we're going to do is kind of uh, translate it down here in... Um, I'll, I'll draw it in blue now, down here. So this would be the failure condition for the contractive one. This would be a sigma VF and a sigma HF. Well, actually, this would be the major principal stress, sigma 1F and then sigma 3F, right? We don't know the stress path, so let's just make them principal stresses. Uh, okay, now... We tested this soil, let's say that we were doing a, uh, a like a direct, the, the same kind of test we were talking about before, where you put some load on the top and then you shear it and it fails, right? So we knew the particular stress that we put on the top, that induced some kind of horizontal stress and then we sheared it and it failed. Okay, and these are total stresses. If we were to add more total stress to it, but not allow it to change volume when we add that total stress, we would get another circle. Let's say that we repeated the test. Um, we would get a circle out here. My blue marker is not working. There it is. Um, here's sigma one at failure and sigma three at failure, and it's the same strength. All right, we haven't let the clay become denser, so it hasn't gotten stronger, and so we can define now a total stress envelope, and it would be like this. And if we're doing um, an undrained um, stress path, we would call this the undrained shear strength. And then the slope of this angle is zero. All right, so we're going to define two new parameters here. F2 is called undrained shear strength. Okay, and V sub U would be the undrained friction angle, but it's just equal to zero, so we usually don't even talk about it. Undrained friction angle. 
Okay, so it turns out that um, the undrained shear strength depends only on the uh, void ratio of, uh, of a clay soil, for example. Um, if the soil is really dense, then the undrained shear strength will be pretty high. If it's really loose, it will be pretty low. But it turns out it doesn't matter how much total stress you apply to that soil, as long as it stays at the same water content or it stays at the same void ratio, it's going to have the same strength. So what we're assuming when we did these tests is that uh, both of these tests have the same water content. Both were equally contracted or equally dilated. So let me uh, make that explicit here. Two tests at the same water content, uh, but different sigma sigma V and sigma H, right? So one of them is at high total stress, one's at low total stress. Okay, so if we were to measure undrained shear strength, um, what we would do is gather soil specimens from the ground, soil samples from the ground, make specimens from them, test them in the laboratory, but take real care not to change the water content. We want to keep the water content exactly as it existed in the field. So we don't consolidate it first, we don't squeeze water out and keep it exactly as it was, and then we shear it pretty fast. And we might shear it under different total stresses and we can develop this undrained strength um, envelope. All right, one thing I'll point out is that sometimes students will call this uh, the cohesion. And this is not cohesion, all right? It's, it's a different thing. Cohesion is fundamentally related to particles that are cemented together in some way or interlocking in some way that gives them tensile strength. This one is not cohesion. Undrained strength and cohesion are different concepts. So um, the terminology is a little complicated, I know, but SU is not equal to cohesion. Um, and you just have to remember SU goes with undrained loading for total stress envelope. C prime, right, cohesion would be the intercept for an effective stress um, analysis. So it's the effective stress envelope. So cohesion, C prime, is an effective stress parameter. All right, whereas SU, undrained strength, total stress parameter. All right, now it turns out that when we're designing infrastructure and we're dealing with soft, fine-grained soils, clays and silts, often the undrained shear strength is the controlling factor, right? We want to know how much strength does this soil have in its current condition in the field that controls how much load we can put on it without failing the soil. So it is actually fairly common that we do a total stress analysis for fine-grained soils, for silts and clays, even though we know that total stresses are not fundamental. What's actually happening is controlled by effective stresses, these inner particle stresses, and the more Coulomb failure envelope. It's just that we can't really reasonably estimate the effective stresses. So we switch to a total stress analysis instead we just have to take a lot of care to make sure that we're testing the soil in the condition that it exists in the field because if we make it denser or looser as part of sampling it or preparing it for testing in the lab we will change its strength and we, then we won't get a good representation of what exists out in the field in real life and our design calculations might be wrong as a result.